Um, welcome to the um, live stream um, on Twitch and welcome to everyone who may watch this after on YouTube as we're intending this to be a public um, um, video. So it's the final live stream for the Ship of Fools. As I said, it is public, so please um, stay spoiler free um, no, and no spoilers in the chat either and we will endeavour um, to do the same. Um, no <laughs> yeah, no promises. No, <laughs> lots of promises. Um, so what do we have in store for tonight? I can see that people are saying that we're a little bit echoey. Hopefully that will resolve itself. Um, I will just swap over to what are we discussing today? Hey, um, Excellent. Um, thanks, Roderick. It's confirmed. It's the echo sorted now. So um, what are we discussing today? So first, um, we're going to um, in introduce ourselves properly. I think the last time we talked about what we've done in the past, but today we'd like to talk a little bit more about um, Rookery Publications and what we, um, what the company is and who we are. Um, then we will finish off um, with a bit of an um, end to the Ship of Fools playtest, a summary of how that went. Um, then we will move on to um, a couple of products that we'd like to talk to you about that will be coming up in the future as um, some examples of the work that we plan. Then what's next after that? And then finally, some Q&A. Of course, if you've got any questions, though, um, please just share them in the chat and I'll try and bring them in as we go through. And that is um, our plan for this evening. Um, I will just go in a line down. Shall we move straight on to um, introductions? Perfecto. I'm going to jump in since I look like I'm after you. I'm Andy. Hello. Um, if you've been following the Ship of Fools uh, playtest for the last age, you already know who I am. Um, uh, in Rookery, my primary job is production. Uh, that's a way of summarizing, making sure all the cool, awesome stuff that all of us make turn into actual final things that we can turn into, hopefully, uh, things to fix our leaky garrets. Um, because we all, after all, need a penny or two to survive. Um, products, 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 and awesome stuff like that. That's why it's production. Um, I also do a little bit of absolutely anything else that needs to be done. Um, Beyond that, uh, you may know me for mapping, writing, producing, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay in the past, and all those gubbins. Um, they are the past, the future is, awesome rookery bits. So uh, I shall pass over to... To Mark. Mm -hmm. Oh, we didn't get Lindsay. <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna I'll come back to around. myself at the end. All right. Hello, hello everyone. I'm Mark, <laughs> I'm, I'm Mark Gibbons. I'm the uh, art director at Rookery Publications. Um, uh, and actually, just all-round art uh, uh, bod. Um, in addition to illustrations and concept art, I've also uh, lumbered myself with things like uh, layout for, for the production <laughs> of our books, because I realized that I, I, it's after pretty much a lifetime of, of seeing my art squished into corners and in, in inappropriate spaces in publications. So I, we all sort of agreed that the best way to solve that was to actually have me learn how to do it myself. And I've actually found it quite enjoyable. Um, so hopefully, when we get to the final product, it will be beautiful from cover to cover. Uh, so yeah, I mean, in the past, uh, I've been an illustrator and concept artist for more than 30 years in the games industry, uh, video games and, and tabletop. So, but this, again, much like Andy, this is kind of the, the big passion project for me. So very excited to, to bring uh, a rookery publication stuff to you fine folk. Excellent, thank you. Um, Roderick says, Andy Law, you're, we also know you for a very strong beard. <laughs> His beard game is exceptional. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, today, may I say, I'm also wearing a shirt because, you know, it's a special day, the end of the <laughs> Ship of Fools playtest, our first actual big step forward. So it's an actual shirt today. Well, yeah, we, do, we, we, we do. Um, we do. We put ties on for the uh, for our for our quarterly uh, 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 board director's meeting. board meeting. Yeah, we do. proper time. Uh, yeah. We're grown ups. Yeah. Over t-shirts, usually, but still. <laughs> um, Andy Lees? Uh, yeah, hello, uh, I'm, I'm Andy. Um, I, in, in terms of rookery type stuff, I, mostly writing is sort of the main thing um, that I do a lot of, although uh, obviously our playtests have yet to encounter any of the stuff that um, that I have mostly written. That's, that's still to come. Um, but again, although 
I say like I do the writing, like it really is a very collaborative process, um, both in terms of discussing the ideas and then kind of working with Andy on my subsequent drafts and then him drafting as well. And then Graham with editing and everything, not to mention Mark having brilliant ideas and Lindy pitching him those ideas as well. And yeah, it, by the end, it's impossible to tell who actually wrote which words. Um, it's sort it of a, a, a beautiful melange out of, out of everybody's stuff. But a lot of the, the grunt work... Yeah, exactly. Uh, the spice must flow. Um, a lot of the, the grunt work of, of getting the, the words down, first of all, uh, a lot of that comes from me. i uh, also doing a lot of the social media stuff just now. Uh, so it's normally me on Twitter, um, if you're interacting with me there, and on Facebook, although I hate Facebook, so I don't go on there very often, whereas I'm on Twitter <laughs> quite a lot. Um, and since we're all talking about the future and moving to the future, obviously, Lindsay and I will be doing a podcast, um, which is uh, something to come. So more on that in the future. Uh, over to Graham. To Graham. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name's Graham Davis. I'm the managing editor of The Rookery, uh, which, as Andy just explained, means uh, I just uh, bundle in with everybody else and try and get the words <laughs> as good as they can possibly be. And uh, I, I did the initial writing from uh, for Ship of Fools, but it's been through the rookery process, so it's everybody's now. And uh, that's uh, that's how it's going to be in the future. Um, always been one of my favourite things to do is just kicking ideas around and coming up with stuff that nobody could have come up with on their own. And it's a lot of fun. And uh, in the uh, in the past, I've worked. Uh, quite a bit on Warhammer Fantasy roleplay, various other role-playing games, 40-odd uh, video games. Uh, yeah, I've done a bunch of stuff, but this is really exciting because it's just uh, a bunch of people who all get along well doing great stuff that we like. And we hope you will like it too, and maybe even give us money. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> And then finally, um, me. So what do I do? I'm the company secretary. I'm the treasurer. I am an additional writer, an additional editor. I'll probably do most of the proofreading. And um, I generally I look after the um, email and the chat through that with the playtesters. And um, just generally chip in um, on everything from, well, apart from drawing, because I leave that to people who can actually draw. Because I think that's not, why. not necessary, not necessary. You're welcome to draw anything you like. Here's my concept sketch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah so um, that's me. Uh, and what what's next? Sorry, I'm a bit flustered because I yeah. forgot that I had to talk about myself. <laughs> Can I just just briefly? I just want to apologise if I've if I've been looking distracted uh, and and continue to do so. My view out there is my back garden, and I, and I swear, just as Graham started speaking, an enormous crow flew in and oh, started oh. like hanging from the bird feeder on my tree, and is now flapping around in my back garden. So, it's what's an yeah. it's so if, an exactly. So if I look distracted, I'm just watching watching a bird that appeared <laughs> with impeccable timing. So. Does he have Does he have trousers like fluffy trousers? Because if so, he's a rook. He does not have fluffy trousers. Disappointing. Yeah. Disappointing. Um, right. So, what what is next? Um, next we are going to talk about um, the Ship of Fools playtest. I am um, uh, Andy to um, do a bit of a ship of thank yous. I'll do a quick um, stab at this and then let everyone chime in. Um, I want to first say a big, massive thank you to everyone that came along to the uh, Ship of Fools playtest and helped us. I also want to say a big sorry to those of you who missed out, because I know there was an awful lot of people that were coming along afterwards saying, hi, can I join in? Can we help you out? And unfortunately, we had uh, a limited time scale to do this playtest. So we finished this one, but we do have more to come, as we'll discuss a little bit later. Um, the playtest for me was an enormously positive experience. Um, I've been involved with many playtests down through my sadly several years worth of um doing role play bits and bobs um and this one was without doubt and without compare the best um not only did we get a far broader array of opinions coming in um but they've actually made a significant difference to the product that we're building um at the very beginning we had this idea of the ship of fools graham put down some ideas um, finished off the first uh, draft of it. It came to me. I did a whole bunch of extras. It went over to Andy for editing. We had big discussions about it and we popped it out. We thought it was good. Um, through the course of the playtest, most people agreed, but 
importantly, some didn't. And at the points where they didn't, it gave us some very clean outlines as to what we could do to hopefully make it a far better and stronger um, product come the end. Um, we originally started with seven plot lines in the adventure. There's now six. Um, those seven plot lines were very carefully interwoven. Now they're actually slightly more discreet, meaning that individual GMs should be able to pick and choose between those plot lines a bit more cleanly. They still have those interweaving points and they're marked out nice and cleanly, but they're no longer a necessary part of each plot working. Um, the uh, NPC pool got slightly tweaked and uh, adjusted here or there. How we presented some of the um, system agnostic systems that we've used because our adventure can be used by any uh, system at all. It, it's not tied to D and D or Warhammer or no. Cyberpunk. Um, and uh, tweaking all those little bits because of all the feedback was again been a joy. Um, but I'll finish. Well, my biggest joy of all was watching the ship of fools become the ship of something really quite different. We've had sh spaceship of fools. We've had land ship of fools. We've had airships of fools. We've had trains of fools. We've had um, uh, Cthulhu yeah. adventures running around the rims of Africa of fools. Um, it has been an extraordinarily um, creative experience, not just for us, but for everybody out there who's using it. Mm. Um, right from the very outset of the playtest, we said, please use it your own way. Please yeah. do what you normally do as a GM. Don't do what we're most playtests require. Most playtests say, play our adventure the way it is, tell us if it works. Mm. Where we said, play the adventure the way you play it if you just bought it. What you'd actually do with it. Which meant some people went, well, I'd ignore most of it. And this is the bit I like, so I'm going to use that. And that is, from our perspective, a super useful piece of constructive criticism, both in terms of the bits that were discarded and why, but also the bits that were used and why. So um, an enormous thank you to everybody out there um, and uh, an enormous hopeful fingers crossed that you'll be popping along and helping us with the next step of products as we start towards their playtest as well. Yeah, and I'd like to add my own thanks as well. Um, in, in addition to the the sort of technical points that the playtest has helped us with in in layout and plot interaction and so on, um, some people in their sessions uh, came up with some ideas which made all, all of us smite our foreheads and say, "Why didn't we think of that?" And we promptly stole them and put them into the game. So, <laughs> you know, uh, community rules. We're we're developing all this together, and just the fact that. So many people use the adventure in so many different settings with so many different uh, genres um, uh, and so many different sets of rules was exactly what we wanted because it, it's kind of a, it vindicated what we thought we could do in theory, uh, which was produce something that, you know, there's just no barrier for anybody to use it. Uh, anybody can use it. Um, and uh, that was a really good proof of concept for us. And it was very heartening to see all the variety, like Andy said, the spaceship of fools, the landship mm -hmm. of fools, the train of fools, you know, the bus of fools, the <laughs> wheelbarrow of fools, whatever. <laughs> um, all the things you, you guys did with it. Um, uh, it was just brought a big smile to all our faces. And as Grey JP has just um, confirmed, that it was really refreshing to be told to play this as you would. Um, I guess there's not really any point asking people to play it how you would play it because when it's released into the wild, people will play it as they would. So we'd rather know. Yeah, um, and that's, that's yeah. what we want to support. So all the feedback yeah. we get that helps us do that is brilliant. Yeah, and, and thanks everyone. I know it was a, um, a, a not a painful process, but certainly a process to get all those NDAs signed and, and back in and sent back out again. So, um, you know, it was really lovely to... Um, meet everyone by email and, and help people get signed up and, and get through the process. It was, I'm still surprised that it was Roderick's first playtest. As he said, this having been my first playtest, I've probably been spoiled. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> you'll need to do some more now. Um, any Anything else on the playtest or Andy? You well, were I, mostly I, in charge of the feedback. Yeah, I mean, I, I obviously... I mean, I'll probably have to be most careful about spoilers because what I normally mm -hmm. talk about in the playtest is, hey, here's all the spoilery stuff. So I won't, obviously. Um, but that being said, like, thank you not not only for engaging in the thing, but actually engaging within the community and engaging through the forms that we asked you guys to fill in. Um, we've we've got like loads of them back in and a lot of very very interesting and useful insights. And um, in terms of what worked, what didn't work, what worked well, but could have worked better, what worked okay. Um, and so, some of that was was consistent, and then some of it wasn't, which is quite interesting because that then looked at how 
how the games were played. So, oh, you dropped that plot, but then this became a problem for you and things like that. So um, all of that information is good. Um, and But more than that, it very much very much feels to me that, that you have all become a community, which is what we wanted as well. So uh, so yeah. thank you for that. Thank you for being awesome people, uh, epic human beings, uh, and getting involved <laughs> in our community. Thank you. <laughs> from a, from an art perspective, what, what's been interesting is to, is to see uh, uh, favourite NPCs identified. Because that means for me, when I'm when I'm drawing them, I know who to spend more time on. You know, which which characters really resonate with players and, and invest uh, appropriate effort, so uh, everybody feels that they're getting to see those favourites uh, uh, highlighted nicely. So I thank you for that. It's one thing I quite liked about this adventure in general um, was that there was a nice variety of NPCs. So we really did get some interesting um, comments as to favorites and they were widespread. Um, it wasn't um, individual focuses, although there was to a degree, as Andy mentioned every week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, again, because it's, a, it's um, you know, you're, you're the, the sort of the force nature of, of uh, a journey on a boat with a wide mix of characters, you, you know, you, you, you are getting to, to sort of paint a, a broad cross section of, of the sort of societies that you'll be reflected later in the campaign. You're kind of getting picking a few cool, cool characters, cool archetypes, and throwing them into this into this mix and hitting them with adventure. So yeah, it's a great introduction. Hitting them, hitting them with adventure. And like, oops, oh, that's the wrong one. So um, and Galev, sorry, I don't know how Galev, Galev, I don't know how to pronounce their name. Bailed after they realised the initial paperwork pile wasn't the only paperwork pile. We will take that feedback on board and think about how to do things more slickly in future. And when we have the Absolutely. website up and running, hopefully it'll be easier to do things like NDAs in a much um less um sending emails back and forth between each other and and signing things so it's a, oh, <laughs> it, it's a nonsense name it cannot be mispronounced well <laughs> just murdered it peter it is then <laughs> <laughs> great oh well um thank again thank you to everyone involved in the playtest and um shall we move on now to um the next mm -hmm. item um, that we're chatting this evening, which is um, the coiled crown. The coiled crown. Oh. I don't know why the voice. It just has to be done. Yeah. So <laughs> I shall just skip over to there. Hey! Um, I'm, I'm now going to uh, give you all a warning. Um, I have run the next little section four times. It failed twice. So let's see if it works. <laughs> <laughs> Are we ready? <laughs> oh. oh. It didn't. Really? Well, uh, really? really? Well, that's okay. What I can do is I can do that. And if you take off the screen, I can make it work in a second. If I shall do it. Take off the screen. Uh, well, Let's just chat nice. amongst ourselves. <laughs> yep. um, now, we're ready to go again. It was that. Oh, one. okay. Oh. <clears throat> yeah, here we go. Let's see if it goes. Hey! Oh, hey! Look at that. <clears throat> nice to start with an image. <laughs> I love it. I've been describing this as the poster, which is mm -hmm. it's really our kind of like a, a key art for the uh, for the Coil Crown campaign. He can draw a bit, that Mark Gibbons. He's all right. He's, he'll do. Welcome <laughs> to the Coil Crown. Yeah, now that Mark Gibbons is all right. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, anyone want to pick up with uh, what the Coil Crown is? You, you can start, Andy. And okay, then we I'll start then. So as it says, we're exceedingly proud to present um, the Coiled Crown. The Coiled Crown is our collective umbrella term for all of the uh, system-free fantasy products that we're releasing. Um, and these products will include pretty much everything that any GM and in some cases player will ever need to play um, their version of the Coiled Crown with whatever system they prefer. We're going to have adventures, monsters, maps, magic, locations, NPCs, all, all kinds of cool, crazy stuff. But in every single um, instance, these uh, products are going to be entirely self-contained. So for example, as it says at the bottom, all linked together by an epic campaign you will never forget. <laughs> well, of course, it's going to be awesome. Um, but we're doing something a little bit different with our epic campaign that you'll never forget. He's, he bashes his uh, microphone. Um, and 
we are ensuring that each part, whilst they link into each other cleanly, is also an entirely discrete adventure. Indeed, um, every part of what we build, whether it's extra monsters, extra bits and pieces, are all going to be entirely 100% discrete. You can do whatever you want with it and will be filled tip to toe with options, different ways to present it, different um, levels of play, so to speak. Um, for example, those of you who have played Ship of Fools are already aware that our adventure because it's not pitched at an individual level, for example, starter players, first to five level players, 20th level players, or whatever, it just says this combat is hard, easy, difficult, or whatever, to ensure that you can pitch it according to your groups. All of our products are following a similar run through. Um, the core concept is you can take it in and do what all GMs do, which is adapt it for your own games. Um, it's what we do. Um, we rarely like picking up a product and running it as it is, because often it's somebody else's perfect narrative and your own perfect narrative is almost certainly better. Um, so what we're saying is we recognize that. So we're going to provide you with an epic campaign you will never forget. Largely he says that every time. Yeah, every time. Yeah, every time. Um, you every should time. see me in the meetings. Yeah. Um, with the voice and everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so whilst we are, of course, um, uh, doing that, one of the reasons it's going to be an epic campaign you'll never forget is because it's going to be your epic campaign that you'll never forget that takes into account not just your preferences, but, and one watchword that we um, were just discussing the other night, actually, um, we intend not just to entertain the players. This is a big one. We also intend to entertain the GMs. Now, that may sound like it's an obvious thing because the GMs get to play, but most often with pre-printed adventures and similar, they have very fixed paths to ensure that they can run them. Um, and the GMs themselves are fully aware of everything that's going to happen um, if they run a pre-prepped one. Um, and it's often just being a mouthpiece as they move from one scene to the next. Now, they might enjoy doing that, and there's nothing wrong with enjoying doing that. But um, as a GM myself, I much prefer doing free flow uh, campaigns where the players are as involved as me with the stories and plot lines. So they shock me to a degree because the players go off at hearing in a direction I never expect. Um, and one of our core concepts is ensuring that the GMs can be as equally entertained by the outcomes as the players. And as What Rides Beneath will show when we can move on to discuss that, it opens with something that I hope will be a statement of intent. Yep. There you go. Are you intrigued? No, I, <laughs> I should add an evil laugh. <laughs> uh, there we go. <laughs> um, so um, uh, that all aside, since everyone's sort of laughing. Sorry, it was silent. my fault. My, my mic was muted because ah, there, there was many police cars going past outside. <laughs> I had muted myself some time ago. Um, yeah, so hopefully that does intrigue you. Um, and oh, interesting, just on your point, Andy, so if a game session goes the way I imagined it during prep, I feel the session has failed. Very well <laughs> said, yes. Yeah, well said. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and we're doing something slightly different on that. I think I'm going to actually pick that one up in particular. It's not just that we're looking for the GMs to not know how it's going to end. We're looking for the GMs going into a scene where they have an idea of what might be happening, but the players are going to be leading them to the conclusions. Um, and they don't necessarily know what the players are doing either. It's, well, who as I said, <laughs> a statement of intent with the first scene. So you'll hopefully see what we mean when we do that. And we're um, intending as we move through our various adventures for them all to be quite different. Our first one was, um, and it's almost a handover to Graham for this one, it was very much a Graham Davis special um, because he's particularly known for doing one type of adventure. The next one is completely different. Um, again, where we're going for a far more, at least initially it looks like it's a far more linear one, but as I say, the opening scene isn't. Um, but uh, yeah. Each one will be different, and that's part of the fun for us as well, because every time we create something, it will be new and fresh. Um, and you can never be quite sure what the next thing from the rookery will be or how they're going to tackle it, which will be stressful and fun. Yes, <laughs> All yeah, at once. Yeah. Um, hmm. I keep staring at this pic. I'm getting lost in it. That's very, it was very much my experience of painting it. <laughs> <laughs> I was <almost> snorted there. <laughs> Yeah, there's, mm. there's always something. The eye just kind of travels off it, and there's always something to pick up and focus in on and be surprised by. 
Well, yeah, that's very, I love very it. kind of you to say. Yeah, it, it was I, it was me wanting to do something that felt as much like an album cover or a poster, a movie poster, yeah. uh, which is very much the approach I'm taking to these to these bigger pieces. So hopefully um, we get products that don't look uh, like your, your typical um, RPG uh, you know, package. Yeah. I think that's, um, again, something that we've all discussed in our various meetings where we constantly go, what can we do to try and present something that's just not the same as everything out there? Because if we're just reiterating the products that you can get from any of the various game studios out there, ranging from the biggest right down to the smallest, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Why don't we just get hired by them? Um, and because right. most of us have got, well, all of us, in fact, are award winning in our fields, all of us, every single last one of us, whatever it may be, um, we could easily get hired, whether it's for writing, mapping, ma arting, editing, whatever. I probably earn quite a lot of money doing it, too. Um, and and that's that's tempting because who doesn't like money? Whilst at the same time, point being really quite after so many years of doing that, a bit depressing mm -hmm. because it's nice to be able to do our own thing. And look at um, what the market offers and say, yeah, you know, wouldn't it be nice if? Um, yeah. And All we discuss that almost every week. Cry, you know, that no one yeah. would ever let us, or that we've been afraid yeah. to ask. We can just go have have fun. Oh, oh, oh. So I, I did, there was a, a, a bit of a segue there, and that was into, um, from the art that looks a little bit unusual and maybe not what you expected, to um, in the um, Ship of Fools, you encountered a particular creature, and um, we'd like now to talk about one of our next products, or one of the products that goes along with um, the others and that is the marshlands bestiary indeed I'm, I'm, i'll pull the first one down there and go yeah box on me um, um i'll drop a quick yeah. intro and say that um yeah. uh, the marshlands bestiary like all of our products is designed to loop in with everything else that we're doing so it's the coil crown because it's constantly looping but it's far deeper than that so for example we start off um arriving the after fields it's an area um and it's all boggy marshy and there we go here's our first thing take it over mark <laughs> uh well thank you uh i'm just reading through the little the little uh the piece on there and we talked about the uh um the bog mummy being juicy and i i i don't want juicy mummy in my head as a, as a phrase ever <laughs> um, yeah so but but and, and the, the bog mummy here is, is a is a good example of one of the one of the creature types that we're that we're kind of building up uh for the afterfields which is the area outside of the city when you when you assuming that you arrive on the ship of fools uh you arrive outside the city then you explore the afterfields before moving into the city proper so it's its own little uh, ecosystem so we thought yeah let's do some let's do a bestiary to cover some of the creatures uh that the, the players are likely to encounter and uh, the bog mummy is 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 one of a uh what i'm currently putting together as a, a sort of suite of undead uh, uh fenland monstrosities uh that we hope will will hang together as a nice little uh, little kit um and yes to, again take taking some of those again fat undead fantasy archetypes and hopefully uh, uh putting our own little unique spin on them so that gms will will want to use them and not default to a standard uh, D D or, or warhammer type creature yeah, yeah absolutely mm. yeah and and like mark said this uh, the the bug mummies this is one type there are many other types and there's a nice sort of culture and rationale and history behind them that's all part of the sandbox we've created in the uh, the afterfield so everything kind of slots together um and uh the uh, the adventures uh go pass through the sandbox but the sandbox remains yeah and um because we are not tied down to a specific setting um we can go a little bit wild while some well, simultaneously um, referencing all the things that we like, yeah. dropping them in um, and hoping, because we obviously like the coolest stuff, um, that you will also like the coolest stuff that we like. And 
ensuring that we can pop them forward to you and say this will hopefully go into a different it was like you were reading my mind <laughs> That's um, the idea and drop yeah. it into literally any other fantasy game you want so they are yeah. both familiar while simultaneously being unique and new mm. uh, look, andy's andy's got a good head now i do feel <laughs> bad that the comments keep on going over <laughs> <Andy>. <laughs> What I like about these as well is I think they're a really good example of that kind of collaborative process that we were talking about before. Um, because there were, you know, there was a concept and some initial stuff written, and then like Mark kind of developed that some ideas, and then we discussed that, and then so and it's it just it keeps evolving, and in every iteration, they're getting better and more interesting and more nuanced and more unique, oh, yeah. and I think more exciting and more appealing as, as a result of that. And um, yeah, it's, it's a really really enjoyable and kind of febrile creative process. So yeah, yeah and it's, it's worth adding as well that much like anyone who is part of the Ship of Fool playtest knows. Um, there are going to be changes. So even though this currently says bog money is this, who knows by the time we release it, it might be the, Bill, Bill the paddle wielder is this. Because um, we are constantly reiterating, that's not going to happen. It's not going to be Bill. It'll be something else. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, <laughs> Bill. Um, but uh, it is a constantly evolving process. And as we move towards our, I just love me a coracle too. When uh, I do. Uh, yeah, like I do love a coracle because of Narnia. I'm sorry. But like Reapy Cheap had his own little coracle. So I've always been fond of a coracle. <laughs> <laughs> well, we move on to the next one. Yeah, yeah. move quickly on from my Narnia. Ah, one. the Sluffish. Now, this is one that yes. um, anyone who's played Ship of Fools will already know because the Sluffish do feature in one of the um, parts of it, um, or at least their products do, not to give away any spoilers. Um, and indeed, that's what's referenced there. Um, ugly eels. <laughs> slimy, slimy, slimy things. Yeah. I have yeah, a particular yeah. hatred of eels, so I always feel sick every time I even hear the word sloughfish. <laughs> um, for, uh, again, for those of you not part of the Ship of Fools playtest, um, sloughfish can be pronounced more than one way. The um, commoners um, generally refer to it as the sloughfish. However, there's some nobles who prefer it to it. Uh, iterate it as the slough fish. However, mm. given that the word that they're referencing, slough, as in to slough off your flesh, it's almost certainly was originally linguistically at least sloughish, but you know, nobles. Yep. What can you do? <laughs> what can you do? <laughs> I, I like a, the fact uh, people are suggesting they call it the slough fish, uh, <laughs> as if it should be like chopped up with some onion and cabbage and served with mayonnaise, <laughs> but yeah. Um, <clears throat> Carefully avoiding spoilers, will there be an excuse for Andy to map a city in one of your releases? I'm, I'm sure, sure there will be. We'll come um, back to that. Yeah, yeah, totally. Right, well, it's a uh, drop down to what we got now. Dum, 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 up from the Derbs, Fendrick. Bam. Yes, we, it, 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 what was it? Yeah, we, we, we wanted to a sort of crocodile type, but not just a crocodile. And uh, I, the back and forth about what we were going to call it, I think, was, was as... Uh, it took far longer than it did to illustrate. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're funny. I just, I just noticed for the first time the uh, the severed boot with leg bones mm. sticking out of it. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yes. uh, yeah, a little bit now. And again, the uh, the uh, the boat hook or the bill hook stuck in its, That's right. its spine. So I try and inject a little bit of a narrative into these things when I can. Yeah, and I I love how the uh, the little detail of like moving the positioning of the eyes. Like mm. further down the snout as well. Like just that in and of itself just makes it look really interesting and very different from from the thing that inspired it, the kind of crocodile. So yeah. Yep. Cool. Uh, his, the, the tail looks particularly wicked as well. Yeah. Like it's longer it than a, a, a crocodile's tail would be, and it looks like it could really like impale you on its tail. It, it does. It's the, those notches For those make it look like a, a, a battered and rusty pole arm of some sort. Just marking the eyes in case. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, you can yeah, see a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, the face is a bit, with well, the underbite, it's a bit sort of bulldoggy, yeah. uh, which I kind of, uh, not what you normally yeah. expect from a, a crocodile. Type. That's it. I mean, just look at the muscles around that jaw. Like, you you really, really don't want that thing biting you. <laughs> or death yeah. rolling you. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, let's move on swiftly. Um, the helicon, and that's the last of the images we'll be showing for uh, the best tree this time. <laughs> yeah, just a, a pelican with a, a really nasty pelican, uh, uh, <laughs> the big spiky, spiky teeth, uh, and um, uh, as a, a threat. This is, I mean, this is a creature that is a we introduce it in the in the afterfields, but it's also, as you can imagine, 
um, a, a massive pest within the city that we move on to. Certainly in the in the, the Docklands area, these things will yeah. will snap up your pets, your small children, um, horrible, stinking, uh, uh, hostile, aggressive birds, and you can imagine uh, uh, players getting getting sort of drawn into to, mm. to plots and missions to go and sort of clear out a colony of them from a from a location or rescue uh, um, a, a, a captured beloved animal a pet or child uh yeah and j just sort of um again they feed into the uh uh the culture of the of the city uh any way you encounter them they are sort of constant uh um frustration mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, it looks like a Dundee seagull that's quite a niche <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah and we'll absolutely steal your chips yeah, the hand that's holding work. the chips as well, most likely, no yeah. doubt. It yeah, will take the whole arm. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I actually love the helicon far more than I should. It was originally um, uh, something that I think Mark suggested, right, very near the beginning when we were first putting things together, and he was like, "I want a helicon," and I was like. <laughs> Like hell you can. That sounds awesome. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, it was one of the first um, images, um, not this one. It was um, one of the earlier sketches right near the beginning um, when we were putting together some of the tones and the themes um, for the first area that you'll visit inside the city. Um, and uh, I think it's fair, probably not. I think it's fair to say that um, regardless of what we release, the Helican is always always going to hold a very special place in my heart because of that because it's uh it's one of those initial points where the fire is lit and mm. uh that just makes me smile yeah skulls on the posts yeah essential mm. yeah <laughs> um so there you go that is is that that's all we're sharing for the marshlands best yeah that's all we've got no, for the marshlands best tree um, but um, hopefully that gives you a flavour of um, the content, the general feel, the the theme for the Marshall Inspector. And um, to add an, another just general point, um, much like the other material we're creating, the aim is for this to be system agnostic. The aim is for um, all of the creatures that we provide to not just be usable in your game, so we give you some statistics that you can adapt according to your spam system of choice but beyond that we also try to make sure that every single thing that we uh, produce is usable so it's not just here is beast one here is beast two here is beast three because ultimately you can get that in any beast three we're also making sure that the story is tied to them there's lots of little snippet details things that bring them to life so that uh, they're not just the creature of the week for your next game there's something that could potentially populate an area in your game something that um, could be something that recurs and you come back to because there's more than one adventure seed that sits there as a potential starting point for how best to use them and much like everything else we do intend to on something like this one the playtest will be on a far smaller group but we'll be running a playtest in these as well because something like this which is system agnostic creatures requires some eyes um because mm -hmm. for all we think we've nailed it um once you actually put it out there everyone will say yeah but um, and we need those yeah buts because those yeah buts can ensure that we take what we've got and polish it up really um, shiny and uh, hopefully provide something that uh, a broader audience than ourselves can definitely use. Right. And that can make the difference between um, players of a particular game being able to use it and not. And one of the things we're committed to is finding and removing all the reasons for people not to be able to use it. We want it to be available to all. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Yeah, so there's a question in the chat that really um, sums that up. For GMs completely allergic to combat presumptive encounters, so I never use them, will the critters be described in terms of their cultural impact, opportunities for non-presumptive challenges, etc.? I think they yes. absolutely will. And a really good example of that is the sluffish and its importance to the economy. Yes, yeah. true. Um, it's very true. Now, uh, to add a small detail on top of that, since you weren't part of the Ship of Fools playtest, um, Ship of Fools, as uh, we discussed at quite at length during the course of our weekly streams for that, it was designed around the idea that you can get through that without a single combat, but there's billions of potential combats as well. The aim being that um, the adventure isn't just suitable for any type of play style, it will hopefully encourage different types of play styles as well. Um, if you've got somebody who's very used to just playing D&D, &D, which are often combat presumptive encounters, um, hopefully they can get something out of that by um, being taken into a situation where 
not going into combat might be a better option. Uh, crazy, I know. Um, uh, whilst simultaneously, for people who are used to games that are far more, mm, let's say, investigating um, in nature, um, there's still a couple of big, here's a bad guy um, uh, situations, but there's always another route through. Okay. Uh, it's important that the PCs can be creative. Challenges that the PCs solve <laughs> creatively Absolutely. rather than mechanistically. Yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's something that we all uh, love. Uh, Graham <laughs> adores it, brings it up all the time. Um, right. He's like, hey, hi, yeah, we need this. Um, I think, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I've yeah. been pulled up a couple of times on uh, my tendency to sucker players into combat and, oh. and then punish them for fighting when not using <laughs> their brains. I'm a little too harsh that way. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think we heard we heard about um, Grey JP's um, group through the <laughs> through the course <laughs> of the playtest and their oops and their mercenary ways. <laughs> Certainly were. <laughs> I, I think one of the other things that's maybe worth mentioning just about about the best jury is the fact that um, in in addition to all, you know all all those kind of details about the the creatures, we're also providing hooks for them as well. Yeah, so just yeah. like we do for our locations, we've got adventure hooks for that. Mm -hmm. We've got the same thing with that. So you yeah. want to use the thing. We've actually got specific little adventures and counters plot hooks you can actually kind yeah. of use um, mm -hmm. to to kind of make something of it. So yeah, I think make that, sure that, that, that every will... creature has a, a reason yeah. to be in your game. Yeah, um, it'll aid, aid that that integration. So. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, yeah, agreed entirely. But well, we move on to the next slide. So we've got another little slidey thing because we've got where we're going to next. Um, yep. There's just one question about the bestiary. We can just cover that. Um, will all the creatures in the bestiary? Absolutely. Uh, yes, and excessively yes. so. <laughs> Mark loves <laughs> his beasties. <laughs> well, I, I, I've, I've, I've made my peace with the fact that I'm going to have to illustrate hundreds of NPCs. So any chance I get to draw a monster, I'm all over it. <laughs> <laughs> Quite right, too. Um, yeah, Mark loves his beasties. And um, in, in some and regards... we love Mark's beasties. Yeah, be I was about to say that. That's one of the best bits, because we love Mark's beasties. <laughs> yep. um, it's, it's great, particularly when um, an idea pings around, and then Mark goes, I went away and I thought about this, and I've made this! And you're like, okay. Yeah, yeah that's it's... cool. Yeah, and then we go back and write a whole bunch more because he's done this and he's done yeah, that totally. and he's added this and it's oh my goodness it's the creative dream i think for all of us to, to have that that back and forth and there's nobody yeah. turning around saying no we've got to get to the printers or no there's no space for that because that's exactly. happened i think to all of us countless exactly. times through our careers where so yeah it's a nice idea but you know we've already this is the page count so there's no there's no room for it so to have yeah, totally. to have that that flexibility to add cool stuff through the process as it occurs to yeah, us is yeah. uh, is uh, rare and um, and cherished. Mm. And to further um, develop on uh, one thing that we can do, which often is not easily done, particularly by the larger publishing houses, is as we work our way through it and we get feedback, we can just tap that straight in. Yeah, um, we we can yeah. be constantly reiterating and looking at things and then developing that and using that for the next springboard as we move into the next areas of what we plan for our as, campaigns. Yeah, as we did with Ship of Fools, there were a couple exactly. of brilliant ideas that emerged through play that we just Slippy had to incorporate. Sleepy. Indeed. No spoilers. No spoilers. No spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> no one close. wants to be the Tom Holland of this stream. No. <laughs> well, I mean, that wouldn't be so bad. But... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, given we've got the afterfields up, the afterfields is the first um, area that we're depicting, and it's um, it's our bridging area. Um, it's something that will be relatively familiar to everybody in terms of what it represents, while simultaneously having our stamp on it, um, and is the area you move through before you hit where the big city that we're building. Our city doesn't have a name um, other than the city all the way through it. That's not because the city doesn't have a name, that's because you name it according to your individual setting, according to your individual needs. Um, we've got an entire hierarchy for our city and a hierarchy for the afterfields, um, but again, everything that we're producing is not produced in a prescriptive, this is what it is, it's produced in a, here's what it um, could be, here's what we think is really cool, but you could also do it this way. Um, one of the joys of us being um, a team with different tastes is that inevitably we'll sometimes come up with completely different ideas for loosely the same thing. So that means that we can go, right, well, let's do them all. Yep. Um, and we can drop them all in, in one fashion or another. Um, and if one particularly, uh, 
supports the narrative that we're building for, say, an adventure. That's generally the one that will be mainlined in, while yeah. the other ones will be dropped on. Um, because we've, as I say, we do have an epic campaign, and our epic campaign is already planned. We know how it's ending. We know pretty much every single step of the way. Um, but that's that's a wee while to get there, but it does mean we're already foreshadowing the end in every single thing that we're doing. Um, we are working towards the end goal right from the mm. beginning. Yeah. Cool. Uh, other than that, well, I suppose that's a nice way to say. Is there anything else anyone wants to pick up on the afterfields? I have to say I really like the logo. Um, you know, back to the, the point about the creatures being interwoven into the world. I think um, I really like what Mark's doing with the logos for the houses, for in this case the afterfields, because it, it gives you a sense of what it is before your players or you have even read about what it is. Yeah, I, I enjoy. I really enjoy the the, the gra as, as much as I enjoy uh, illustrating uh, and concept art for for characters and for creatures. I also really enjoy the challenge of graphic design. You know, uh, that's it's it's a whole different section of the brain you need to engage for it. So it's nice to bounce around and do these things. So yeah. So I, I, we've got within us within our city there are all the various different uh, factions and locations all have. Um, uh, an awful lot of sort of iconography and a symbolism attached to them, and it's been really fun to to pin some of those down. Yeah. I love this one. Um, I love yeah. this one because this is not one. Often in the creative process, when it comes to heraldry and similar, um, the writing process almost by its very just the, just the way it happens creates the symbols by themselves. Particularly if you've got um, strong themes for particular households or areas or something similar. We never at any point said this is what the symbol for the afterfields is. We just wrote the afterfields is in the very simplest of terms um, an entire area um, that the the Royal Navy has. Uh, I'm trying not to give any spoilers. Created for want of a better description, um, and is now a big bread basket, um, and that's that. <laughs> it's just beautiful. <laughs> that is it in a nutshell. It's it's a big anchor, and it's it's our wheaty bits and a skull for good measure. Of because um, yeah, the, the, because the, skulls. We're not saying that it's an author authoritarian place either, but it's a. Uh, it's just brilliant. I love this image and I can't gush about it enough because when I first saw it, I was like, this this, this is perfect. I have no comment. I'm going to walk away with this smile. I, I expect to see you freshly tattooed with it before long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, watch this space. Um, so I'm just going to bring this comment up because it's really amused me. I'm grateful that you only have one Graham. RPGs have enjoyed multiple excellent Grahams, but it gets confusing if they cluster. On the yes. other hand, you've got a double Andy, which will be a winning hand in a fantasy card game someday. <laughs> actually, they're both of their names is, act are, is actually Andrew, but they are professional names that they use in RPG writing is, is Andy. But amongst family and friends, I think they're pretty much interchangeable and um, as it happens in our role-playing group we have another andrew so actually i think you'll find it the winning hand of the double andy would be trumped by the triple andrew yeah wow i i had to as you were saying that Lindsay. I, I, obviously what you were saying was that andy and andrew are pretty interchangeable but i actually <laughs> interpreted that as andy and i were pretty much interchangeable and i'm like yeah i actually was nodding with that before i realized what you actually meant <laughs> I, i've always assumed that's been the case <laughs> awkward turtle yeah. <laughs> yeah awkward well it's also that both both andy l so it's it's like when yeah. whenever i'm talking to one andy the other i i just have to say oh the other andy or andy yeah. two and it andy. refers to whichever andy i'm not talking to at that time yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, well, it's, yeah, both Andy L, L born in Dundee, both of whom yeah. work for Games Workshop locally. Um, oh, both of whom have, it's, it's just awful. Yeah. Um, and we yeah, we, at least we don't share a flat anymore. For a while. That's true. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. What was that? What was it? Was um, Lindsay was saying we used to share a flat, and I was saying at least we don't live in, a, in the same flat anymore. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it does well, get confusing when we're both saying. Yeah. Um, because there's also someone who's married to the other Andrew. So it becomes like my Andrew, your Andrew, which is obviously interchangeable depending on who's talking. Move along the bus now. Ah, <laughs> 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 oh, look at us. Oh, yes. <clears throat> 
Yeah, so um, our next step in terms of uh, playtesting is What Rides Beneath. What Rides Beneath is the adventure that both follows directly on from Ship of Fools and is also 100% discreet. So if you've played Ship of Fools um, as part of the playtest or if you pick it up later when we uh, finally finish it, um, you'll have an adventure that leads on directly, includes some of the same NPCs. But simultaneously, this adventure was actually written before Ship of Fools was even written. Um, so what rise beneath is it, it couldn't be more standalone if it tried. The reason that I'm not going to give it out as a playtest now is because we've got Ship of Fools, which we're just polishing off, and there's a whole bunch of stuff from that that we now want to bring in and install into what rise beneath as a bunch of potential um, options for those who have played that. Um, it's uh, in the process of doing that, so we're not going to be uh, announcing our next playtest now. Um, we have uh, our what next section to i suppose deal on with that but um we are pretty close to having that in place um i'm going through the last passes just now and then it'll be getting fired back to um andy and graham to do their righty bits in it and then everyone else to put their extra eyes on before we polish that off into a, a finished thing to present to everyone for the uh, play test number two <laughs> i feel like i should be cackling again <laughs> oh, <crying. laughs> oh, sorry, um, just lost it again there. <laughs> and, and I suppose we can say without any spoilers at all, a certain event that is alluded to in the playtest of Ship of Fools does occur as part of what rides beneath. Absolutely does. Those of those of you who know will know what I'm uh, what I'm referring to. Those of you who Ooh. don't will just have to wait. <laughs> just just wait and see. Um, I I. Just to say one other thing about this one, I kind of love this adventure, um, which is why I'm dreading it going to the playtest, because inevitably when you like a thing, it's the one that you get the most criticism for. Um, and it's the one that you inevitably <laughs> have to make some of the larger changes to that you're not going to want to do. Um, for those of you who were part of the playtest, you'll know that I have a I have a great hankering for killing my darlings. Um, the things I like, I tend to go, well, I really like that one, dead, um, through the course of playing things. Um, or at least make it a very clear option of the PCs are idiots that those loved characters are going to die. Um, but, uh, yeah, this one, uh, th this one Andy did the first draft on. And, yeah. I love this one for a variety Is of reasons. Is it the event that wasn't included, but now will be, thanks to so many players having hopes no, to attend it? It was, it, I think always it is that there. event, but it was always there. It was always there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, that last comment that was very quickly up, yeah, I am also torn by exactly this the point. same thing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> sure. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Harsh. Uh, harsh, but fair. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, it just lasts longer that way, you know. <laughs> this is taking so, a dark turn. Moving on. Well, that's all of our slides <laughs> done, so we can uh, just go on to just general chat now, um, which is the um, where we're going next, I suppose. This is a high, I would imagine, high praise from Great GP. Nice. <laughs> I mean, that is unprecedented. Should, should, <laughs> no money involved. Just, what is we this? We have to see about that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Palms may even need to be greased. I don't know. <laughs> so we've got. We do have a few. What about seven minutes left? If anyone does have any questions, I have tried to bring them up through the course of the chat because it's quite hard to go back and find them when mm. we come to questions. That's true. I think Galev, Galev, Peter. Uh, I think he had said he had a question that he wanted for later. Oh um, yes, he did. I don't <laughs> know. If he... I'll answer the. Map I'm going to go with Halev. I'll the answer the map one. There will be maps of that. There's no doubt they will happen. There we go. That was an easy um, one. Uh, I don't know if that was the question that he intended. Oh, no, I didn't even one. see that one. Well, oh, okay, here question. we go. There we go. If things go well, will you be hiring freelancers someday? He asked selfishly. <laughs> um, uh, we do have marked and friends um, on our uh, various social media. And at points, there is no doubt there will be people coming in and doing stuff um, with us because there's just so many good voices out there. Um, mm -hmm. We've bantered about between us as to exactly when that should happen, um, what we should do. And the answer we have to that moment is when we're ready for it. Um, and that might be soonish if we nail down everything that we're happy with and we think mm -hmm. we need to have more voices here just so that we can get everything out that we want out that might be sometime later because we're just having too much fun with it um uh, it will be entirely down to us and as of yet we don't have an actual 
firm answer. So I no, wouldn't like uh, to confirm anything there. Yeah, some somebody hit me up uh, recently about you know would, would we take would we be using freelance artists and I and I jealously said no, it's mine. <laughs> mine. <laughs> and that's partly partly because uh, at this at this point I'm I'm very keen to establish a, a, a strong visual identity for for the, for our products and that and that I think that's best done with a single artist uh, at the start. Um, I, I do sort of hope that we get to the point where we're so busy and, and, and there's such demand for what we make that I, I'm given no choice but to hire on other artists. Um, uh, so that that will be a you know that will be a great position to, to be in. Um, yeah. But for the time being, certainly for the initial run of, of what we do with the Coil Crown, it's just going to be me doing the art. Mm. I'm going to put a very blunt um, uh, full stop on that and say Mark's not just right; he's spot on. And the, my blunt bit is. We need to sell a lot of shit before that happens. Right. Um, we, that's just bluntly what we need to do. We're, we, we have no money. We have no backers. We're doing this out of our own pocket because we love it. We're idiots. Um, we're creating stuff that we <laughs> yes. really like. Um, yeah. But if it doesn't sell to... It doesn't need to sell to ridiculous bag wagon loads. But if it doesn't sell well, to... We'll mind. never be in a place um, to hire anyone. We've got quite a few questions coming in. So I'm just going to move us along to try to get through them. The dull question was about the the non-presumptive combats. That wasn't a dull question. That was, that that was, was a good question. question. That was a very but, good question, I thought. Yeah. That's exactly what, the kind of stuff we like talking about. Yeah. <laughs> what is the best thing you wouldn't have been allowed to do elsewhere that you've done here? Oh, you'll it's have quite to early to me. answer that question, yeah. I think. And, and hard to answer without spoilers it as well. It is, yeah. 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 Okay. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I, mean, I suppose what, what I'll say is couple. by the end of what rides beneath it, it something happens hmm. that I don't think we'd normally be allowed to, to kind of do. But um but until people play that, I don't want to say anything about it. Yeah, I I can drop in a couple of things um loosely. Uh on the writing side, um when you're working in somebody else's IP and their intellectual property, they always have a very clean idea of what that is or yeah. worse they have no idea what it is but they know um, what they don't like and both oh, of yeah. those things can be deeply frustrating hmm. um when they know exactly what they want but they don't communicate it and you create something that sits within their uh very firm outline and then they come back with a oh but actually it's this 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 and they go into the pernickety details that they never hmm. provided in the first place and we don't have that issue because we just chat amongst ourselves and we nail down our own details. Um, and equally for when they don't want, they don't know what they want, that's when it's at its most frustrating because it's often at, oh, it's just sort of this. You provide them a sort of that that matches exactly what they ask for. And they go, actually, it's this and then this and then this. And it becomes an iterative process, which isn't fun, um, which is um, on the freelance side, something that can occur. But in, the last thing for writing for me is just the freedom to make our own choices without having Very to worry so. about someone else. Yes. Um, yes. And I know that sounds really obvious, but it is as simple as that. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, no, yeah. So um, will there be blogs on the website once it is up? Absolutely. I'm actually doing, yeah, oh, that's the other thing. I, my, art, my other art hat is web designer. Uh, so right now, actually, this week I've been I've been mocking up uh, the, all the pages and, and the blog page is the one I was most recently working on. So yes, yeah. and will there ever be an in-world character creation if we choose to play it as is, as in in our world rather than taking it into your world? Oh, as in, will we provide ourselves a, a system that you could build your own characters with and play within? Yes, but that's not going to be an, uh, an initial worry for us. Um, me being me, I can't help but tinker with mechanics in the background because I'm constantly doing that. I, I game design with my eyes shut sometimes. Um, so yes, we'll have that as a future potential, but it's not something we're worrying about just now. That's very much, it's on the back burner. It's something that will get a few words dropped in it as and when we go, but we need to have all the details in place and everything that we want in place first before mm. we start worrying about that. We are definitely um, yeah. at the outset working on a system agnostic, everybody's role play game um, mm. rather than our own one. But that, then no way, is a measure of our desire to create our own crap. Here's um, an interesting question. Will you include some mechanical, but still system agnostic rules for some challenges in the Coiled Crown, or will it mainly be about story and world building? I reckon loads of them. How much do you love a <laughs> mini game? And you love I adore a mini game. Um, see, one of the great things about role-playing games is that they often provide a very basic system, 
um, to represent a world or a super complicated tactical one or whatever it is. But inevitably, they don't cover a lot of the things that PCs do. Um, like, for example, I sit down and play a game of cards with these people. I'll just make that a gamble test. Why not just provide you with the rules for the card game? That's a yes. sample of what a mini game can provide you. There are all manner of other things, but that's just the easiest way to describe it so that I don't need to go into detail. Yeah. Will there be a systemic, a systematic things all the freaking time because we love doing that? Um, and you just use and the bits you like. Yeah. What, what I think is nice about that example, Andy, as well, is it also relates, it relates to something we talked about in terms of world states as well. But, you know, quite a few of us play um, video game RPGs a lot as well. And while by no means are we trying to, to replicate that exactly, because it's a, it's a different medium and a different thing, Absolutely. there are good ideas in, mm -hmm. in video game RPGs that we can yeah. we can incorporate that haven't really been brought into to tabletop RPGs yet. Yeah. Um and and I think that, you know, both with like the Gwent game in the Witcher or the the one that's in the, the last Assassin's Creed game as well. These mini games often become like as much fun as playing the actual game you're right. playing. So true fact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've Blitz never finished guys. Final Fantasy X because I only ever play Blitzball. Yeah. <laughs> true. <laughs> true fact. I know I have watched true it. Fact. I mean I've um, played it like five times. <laughs> I'm pretty good at Blitzball. <laughs> oh, um, we forgot something. Um, asking about what to do for the next stream next week. Yeah, so there's one last question. So have you considered Patreon Kickstarter so you can buy some biscuits? Um, yeah, we've got a, <laughs> we've got a, um, a, a vague plan. Um, we're we're that. Getting, on getting tighter as we yeah. go. Yeah. Um, we know loosely where we're going with it. And uh, we discussed before this um, in our last meeting, because we meet all the time, um, whether we would publicly say what we intend um and we said yeah loosely um our first plans is some form of patreon um the details of exactly what that will entail will come out in time um but uh it seems to be the best fit for what we're doing um mm -hmm. because kickstarters tend to be um, a finished product uh, a printed thing that gets into your house um yeah. and you you pour over and it's gorgeous and that's something that we'd like to do but we wouldn't like to do that until we had ourselves a full panoply of stuff that got everybody super excited about it. Yeah. So um, will Kickstarter happen? Possibly at some point. It's going to really depend upon how well everything goes as mm. we go through each step. Right. And then the final thing for tonight, there's a really nice comment here from Galev. Oh, thank you. Thank you really sweet. Oh, oh. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. oh, thank you very much. Do come along into Discord if you fancy and chat to us all, because that's always yeah. nice. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, um, so the final thing was we're going to have. So while we continue to work on um, developing the podcast, we are going to continue a weekly stream to, and and we'll be announcing news like where we are with the next um, playtest, etc. But for next week, I don't think we really have um, anything planned. So we just wanted to know, um, and you can share on Discord. Come and join if you're not already on. Um, put comments on on the video once I put it up on YouTube. Um, what you'd like us to cover next week? Is there any particular questions, chats? Um, you'd like to have? You'd like to see us discuss? Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know that you could be all involved with. I mean, uh, we That's won't right. necessarily all be there because we all have um uh busy lives. Um, but most of us generally turn up most weeks and um mm -hmm. we are all chatty chaps and chapettes um and if there's anything <laughs> you particularly enjoy um yeah. listening to us yabber on about mm -hmm. come drop into discord give us ideas drop into our social media channels drop in uh comments as to what you think would be great because that'd be lovely yeah. Yes, someone has suggested 18th century Anatolian ceramics. I reckon we could give that oh, a good I'm start. Totally on board. That, I mean, we could, we could talk about the game Azul. Is that close enough? Um, <laughs> so um, I'm afraid we've finished and we haven't had time to share with you the shanties we've created or the hornpipe I learned this week, especially for oh, this. Cream. I'll have to go. Have I'm to, afraid, that's the potential to ask yeah, the next, yeah. uh, the next I'm sorry. Stream. I'm, I'm afraid we're just out of time. Yeah. <laughs> what a shame. <laughs> um, so thank you to everyone. Thanks to my um, fellow Rooks for joining um, thank you. on the stream. Um, thank you to everyone who participated in the playtest and gave us really um, valuable feedback. And um, thank you to everyone watching today who's popped along and um, asked us questions or just enjoyed the stream. We'll see you all soon. Thanks see you soon. Bye. Bye now. Bye-bye.